Welcome to Career Explore Northwest Live. My name is Tina Swanick and I'm the Career Explore Northwest educator producer for KSPS PBS television here in Spokane, Washington. Career Explore Northwest Live is an interactive Zoom event that connects young people with professionals so they can learn about careers and career paths. And today we'll be learning about careers in civil engineering with the help of a special guest, Wade Gelhausen. Wade is a civil engineer as well as principal for DCI Engineers in Spokane, Washington. Since 1988, DCI has been offering comprehensive structural and civil engineering services, including heavy industrial right-of-way and bridge services to support the vision of their clients and help transform the built environment. The company has offices in 20 markets, spanning from Alaska to the East Coast. And today we're coming to you from DCI's office in Spokane. Hello, Wade. Thank you for being here today. We appreciate you taking time with us uh, to share information about your career and career path. And we also have two schools joining us today. First, we have La Crosse High School and their, their uh, career counselor, Cody Titus. And then we also have Spokane Valley Tech along with their instructor, John Traxler. Thanks again to both of you for making arrangements for your students to be here today and be part of this event. Before we get started, I want to quickly share the agenda for today's event. First, Wade is going to tell us a little bit about his daily work as a civil engineer and his career journey. And then we'll open the floor to questions from our student guests from La Crosse and Spokane Valley Tech. Okay, so let's get started with our event. Again, welcome Wade. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. Will you please share with us a little bit about what civil engineering is? Uh, what that looks like on a daily basis and your career path to becoming a civil engineer. Tina, good morning, everybody. Um, so I'll start with my career path, if you don't mind first, and I'll talk about my day today. So I'm uh, originally from Spokane, was born here, and um, went to school, graduated from uh, Shale Park High School, and that was a long time ago now, in 93, 1993. Um, I continued my education at Gonzaga University, graduated in 1997. Um, I uh, ended, I've worked at a one private small firm in town for five years, and then I've been at DCI the last 20 years. Um, when I was in high school, um, I, I got good grades. I was good at math and science. Everybody's telling me, hey, you need to go into engineering. Um, I know I liked working with numbers. Um, I was deciding between engineering and accounting. Um, ended up going into civil engineering, and to be honest with you, I didn't know all what that meant <laughs> going through it. Um, obviously, going down um, through my through my classes um, at Gonzaga, you know, I went down the journey of civil civil engineering. Um, but once I got out into at past graduation, got into the real world, I still didn't honestly know what I was doing, doing and learned an awful lot on the job. So, um, you know, college taught me how to, how to think and how to, you know, problem solve and, and using those skills, apply those to my, my, in my career, um, in my daily tasks. So, I say that just to, to let you know that even if you don't know, it, it, there's more opportunities today, I would say, than there used to be. I tried to get an internship. I didn't didn't get one, didn't know what I was doing uh, as much. At, I think there's lots of opportunities now to kind of figure that out ahead of time. We do job, job shadows all the time here at DCI and try to take students through the day-to-day -day so they can get an idea of, of what it is. Um, but I, I will say I was a little bit um, unknowledgeable about what I was getting into. Um, uh, that being said, uh, I mainly in my career worked on uh, building development projects. And I'll start with, as a civil engineer, I don't know if you guys all know what that means or not. Civil is a broad um, umbrella of uh, um, having a bunch of other disciplines um, underneath that, including structural, even though our structural engineers in our office here won't admit that they are a part of civil engineering. <laughs> um, and it kind of encompasses traffic engineering, geotechnical soils engineering, um, environmental water resources. So it's, it's, it encompasses a broad spectrum. Um, what I've specifically been involved with though is more building development 
um, projects. And that, that being, for instance, school projects, I've done a number of those. Um, when we um, get on a project as the civil consultant, um, typically under the architect, our job is to grade, provide the elevations for the site grading, um, deal with kind of um, there's, there's soil issues we work in conjunction with the geotechnical engineer on whether there's fill material on the site that needs to be removed and compacted structural fill in place. But we set all the, we set all the elevations for the project, including the finished floor. We, we get the drainage to go, the stormwater to go where it needs to go to dispose of it properly. And there's different ways we handle that depending where we're located. Um, most of the time in the Spokane region, everything gets disposed of in the ground. Um, we get we design the utility infrastructure services to get to feed water, sewer, um, gas, power, conduits, things like that. Communications we get all those um, to the building as well. We do some ro road work um, mainly as part of a building development project. Um, DCI right now we don't do a lot of public infrastructure projects like big road projects. Um, public utilities. W if we work on that, it's usually involved. Um, it's involved with the, pro the directly with the project that we're doing. So, I've worked on a lot of healthcare projects, especially up at the Sacred Heart campus. Um, uh, nowadays, my role as a principal is more to be kind of providing oversight for our whole department. So, I usually get like the tough questions, and I'm doing you know, helping get permits watching our um, invoicing and financial aspects, writing proposals to try to get work. So that's more what I've moved in now in my career, and I'm not doing so much of the day-to-day. -day. Um, I kind of miss those days sometimes when I'm sitting down for three, four hours, maybe more on it at a time, just working on the design of the project. Nowadays, I'm more conditioned to jumping in five to 10 minutes at a time on one thing to the next. So I can definitely tell my attention span has changed, um, having to having to be kind of flexible and jumping in and out of things quickly. So I, I, um, that's kind of a broad overview of what's, what, I, what I do nowadays and how I got to where I am now. So I'll throw it back to Tina. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Wade. Um... Uh, there's a lot of opportunity. It sounds like if you have varied interests in the civil engineering um, field, there's a lot of opportunity to sort of pursue maybe some of those specific paths, which is really exciting. Um, okay, now we will start the question and answer portion of this event. And as a reminder, we won't be taking questions through chat today. And students, before asking your question, if you could introduce yourself with your first name only, that would be great. Thank you so much. And let's start with a question from La Crosse High School. Hi, my name is Landon. Uh, uh, when you went to school in Gonzaga, did he take any extra math classes into the program? Um, I think I heard your question was, did I take any extra math classes as part of my um, education at Gonzaga? Is that correct? Yeah, like which classes you did take? In college or in high school? College. Um, in college, I basically took the um, prescribed um, path to get to the to my engineering degree. I had taken calculus in high school, which was calculus basically first semester of college. So I kind of redid that, which seemed, it always seemed to me that <clears throat> math was difficult somewhat when I was going through it, but once you get past it, it made everything clear behind you all the time. Um, I. So I took calculus, three semesters of it in college. Um, I took ordinary differential equations, uh, statistics. And then um, I think the, the only other math class I think I took was, um, there, was a, there was a prerequisite for organic chemistry and I ended up dropping that class. It was, um, the, it was a difficult class for me, partly because of the way the professor ran the class and they ended up changing that prerequisite to an engineer, I, I could take a different math class. I took engineering mathematics, which was really kind of strange stuff, more applicable probably to electrical engineering. Um, but that's that's kind of, I think that was all the classes I ended up taking in college um, that I had to, uh, to get my degree. I didn't take anything additional to that. That answers your question. 
Hey, Spokane Valley Tech, what is your new first question for Wade? Why did you choose this path of engineering? Um, you know, a lot of people told me that I'd be good at this. Um, and to be honest, I like I said in my intro, I didn't really understand what all that entailed. Um, and, I, and I can't even tell you for sure why I picked civil other than I, I knew I, we, at Gonzaga, we had to take some classes that were mechanical crossover, like thermodynamics, uh, electrical engineering. I had, I had actually started that class at the same time as thermo, and I think I ended up dropping electrical. Um, structural, I struggled with those classes. I, I'm a very, I'm a visual learner, and some of those classes like organic chemistry and um, some of the structural classes, uh, were very um, like heavy reading on your own and kind of solving things on your own. And I, I, get, I, I learned a lot from watching other people work through things. And so I struggled with those. And that's kind of why I ended up staying in, in kind of the water resources, soils, that kind of um, side of civil engineering. But basically it was from teachers, parent, my parents kind of telling me, hey, you're good. Your test scores are really good in these areas. You'd be good at this. And that's kind of why I went down that road. Hey, lacrosse, next question. Hi, I'm Dre. Um, what is your favorite project or best project that you've worked on during your engineering career? I have I have probably a couple. And one of the proudest ones I'm probably, and it, it's, it's probably some people can't even tell um, why it would be or not, but I just know the challenges involved. The Ferris High School was um, the first Spokane Public School project that we got to work on here at DCI on the civil side. Um, we had done some other school work outside of Spokane Public Schools, um, but for some reason we got thrown into that one, which was a very complicated project. Um, there was It was a California campus with like 10 separate buildings and all the utilities funneled through each other. Um, so it, it was a phased project. It had about four phases. And from a civil aspect, from, from my, from a planning standpoint, if you'd asked me, Wade, what was the, what would be the, your choice for the first buildings to come down rather, um, out of the 10 of them? Um, the three that were the last to come down were the, would have been my pick for the first three to come down for, for numbers of reasons. Um, we had to not only design for the new school, but we had to design how to keep the campus running um, in the midst of all that. So if, for instance, we knew we had to put in a water loop across the site, um, but, and, and I'm thinking back, because this was about 2010 to 2014 that this was designed and built. Um, we had to actually run water mains temporarily through um, the additions of the building just to keep utilities running. And then we ended up abandoning them after the fact. So we had to plan. It got really complicated trying to plan out for the phasing and temporary services around all those. So um, that's one I'm really proud of. I've also, again, I've gotten to work on a lot of projects up at uh, Sacred Heart, but I've also got to do a lot on, on the Gonzaga campus as well and being a being that was my school, I got to work on the Hemmingson Center. I was the project engineer for civil, project manager for civil on that. Um, we've gotten to work on the Integrated Science and Engineering Building, Myrtle Walton Performing Arts Center. Um, so yeah, and and on structural side, we actually got to do the McCarthy. We didn't get to do that for civil. So the McCarthy Athletic Center was also a, a structural project for us. So okay, next question, Spokane Valley Tech. Oh uh, yeah, great right here. Um, what was one of your hardest challenges you faced during your career? Um, to be honest with you, I, I'm a, I was pretty introverted. Um, yeah, engineer being introverted, right? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I did not like, first of all, public speaking. I didn't like even conversing a, a lot on the job. Um, it's a little bit, I think there's a tendency with a younger, younger, um, staff in their careers to not want to talk face to face with people and not get on the phone. But I will tell you my first job, um, this, I did not even have a computer in front of me all the time when I first came out, just cause we didn't, we didn't have, have computers enough for everybody at my first job. 
Um, we were still doing faxes um, and not email yet. And it, the tough part was I was told to get on the phone and ask questions with, with people to solve things. And I tell you, I stared at the phone for a while before I'd make a call and just like, what if they ask me something I don't know how to answer? I, that just, that just terrified me to be honest with you. But, um, nowadays I try to push our guys, Hey, get on the phone and talk to somebody. They're not going to, they're not going to bite you. It, it's always better to, um, a, a lot of times it's better to just talk face to face because you're acknowledging each other at the same time that not only, not only you're hearing what I'm saying, but vice versa. So many times we'll throw emails out and it's, and some people think, okay, I did my job. There it is. They'll get back to me someday. Um, that our, our, our work um, and schedule, just everything is so quick nowadays that we can't wait around for that. So um, yeah, just, I'd say just, uh, just learning to be able to converse with people and talk face to face, meet with people and not be fearful of that. Okay, Lacrosse High School, next question. Hi, I'm Chloe. Um, if you could, what would you do different in high school or college? That's a good question. Um, I think, um, I wish I, I guess I wish I would have had a little bit better knowledge of what exactly, and civil can be, civil engineering can be so broad that it's, it's hard to get a definition, but I wish I, I wish I would have had a more clear um, understanding of what I would be doing day to day in my career. Again, that can be a really wide breadth, but yeah, the first day, I think the first day on my job, um, I was told to take on a sewer project. And in fact, I, I did, I, I, at the, I, like I said, I didn't have a computer dedicated to me, but I was sitting in front of a computer in AutoCAD, and all I did was was moving the survey around in the CAD file, which is an absolute no-no because the survey is based on a coordinate system. And so I was just playing with the thing and didn't, and then, and then somebody, I was working on some drainage thing and somebody said, well, just put a dry well in. And I had no idea what a dry well is. And I heard that from a staff member that we had hired recently, they said the same thing. I mean, you're not expected to know everything. And, and a dry well is just basically a manhole, sewer manhole with slots in the side so water can perk out into the soil underground. But I, I didn't really have a clear understanding of the day-to-day -day, um, I'd be doing. And, you know, college being expensive as it is, and it was a lot less expensive when I went to school, but still expensive for the time. You know, I, I wanted to make sure that when I started, I stayed on the path and didn't end up having to spend more time in college. Or, you know, I saw lots of people that started in engineering and moved into other areas outside of engineering. And you're, you know, you're taking more, more time to get through school and therefore more money. But yeah, I just, I, I, I would like us, I think it'd be good for you all to have a good sense of, you know, a direction that you're going and that you understand what, where that's going to take you. And I think there's a lot more opportunities available these days than, than I had to, to figure that out. Uh, next question, Spokane Valley Tech. How well, much direction do you get input yourself in a project? So how much is up to you? How much are you kind of given? Oh, okay. So, um, just like a math problem, I, I, I think I'm going to answer your question right, but tell me if I'm, I'm not. Um, I tell people when you're given a project, it's just like a math problem. It's like I want to know my givens, and I want, and I, I'm trying to solve the unknowns. Now, there's a couple things, especially I'm going to say for Spokane. Um, like any jurisdiction, there's prescriptions on by which you know criteria you need to design to. For instance, in Spokane. We have our sole source aquifer. We try to dispose of every all the stormwater in the ground, but most of the time we have water quality issues that we have to we have to take care of that. We have to design appropriate facilities to take care of that water quality. Um, so that being said, we have drainage calcs we have to do to show we are disposing of the water, but we also have to show we treat it. Now we have to meet those, but we have to figure out where to put those facilities on the site as well. Um, so there's prescriptive measures and, and permitting is a whole other thing because sometimes, or a lot of times nowadays, we argue with the jurisdiction on what we're, uh, we're meeting the standards or not. And 
unfortunately, sometimes, I, I mean, there's a agree to disagree, but at the end of the day, we still have to get a permit. And um, we do what we need to do, but if there's always the cost portion in this too. And that's where I say in Spokane area, um, especially, it seems like cost drives us into design a lot as well. And now civil is civil engineering and what I do, there's not a lot of say fluff we're putting into the project. We try to balance the site for earthwork when we can. We're not running pipes where we don't need them. We're, we're putting in infrastructure that we need to put in. Um, so there's not a lot of, um, I guess, aesthetic things or, or extra frills like uh, like an architect and interior designer can do. Um, you know, there's some things you can do with landscaping um, and maybe sustainability when like water harvesting and things like that. Most of the time in Spokane, those things get cut out. And it's, and it's kind of weird when we work on a project for let's say a state funded project or something on the west side of the of the mountains, there's a little bit of a difference where money is not so much of a, a critical component of it. Like, yeah, we can, we'll pay for that to do this cool thing. And time and time again, though, here it's, you know, it, I mean, go to Seattle, go to Portland, go to those places. You'll see some really cool projects. Our climate also drives us into things as well. We, there's cool stormwater facilities you'll see on the west side that we typically can't do here just because of climate. Snow, a lot of our storm facilities are used for plowing snow into, um, just the icing. So so I don't know if I answered it, all your questions, but it gets it gets pretty prescriptive here, in, but that's not the case in all locations. Um, but money and code usually drives us into a certain, a certain direction. Structural side, you know, we explore different types of systems for the project. Um, and, you, you know, again, it's cost driven, but it also can be, you know, it, we, we do a, um, design work on a building called post tension design. And what that can do is get your, your floors to be very thin, uh, floor plates thinner than, than a stamp, like a conventional framing system. And so again, there's there, but there's, you know, you get a thinner floor plate, maybe the skin on your building is not as, as tall. So there's some, I'm using that as an example of, there's some creative things we can do to a point, but it's all usually driven, code-driven and cost-driven components in there. Next question, lacrosse. Tucker, what would you say would be like the hardest, most challenging like projects that you've worked on? There's two ways I can answer that question. <laughs> Sometimes the owner can make things very difficult and we are experiencing one of those projects right now. So I'm not going to mention names, but um, we actually have been working on a project where everything that we've designed has been questioned to the point of like, and, and then telling us what to do, not what's in our engineering judgment. And I don't like to get in that position because we we should do you know we shouldn't just we try to do what the owner wants to do but there becomes a point where doing so we don't think is in the best um is the is the best thing for the project and when i say owner let's say a public like a public entity an owner there's still an owner's rep but it's also taxpayer funded dollars so when they're telling us to do something that may be not meeting their own code or we think there's going to be an issue down the road and we're explaining that they take that as being difficult so we actually got removed from a project kind of for these very reasons so i will say that there's challenges from just doing what an owner wants us to do versus what we think is correct for a project and so that's one challenge but then there's also just the challenges of this is a really difficult site and you know, you know there's a lot of issues with it um one of the projects i worked on um was it's up behind sacred heart um it used to be the pamel building i think it's lab corp now 
um, off of Grand, and uh, the park end is just to the is on the low end of that site. That site was originally um, had, it had a big a large building there, but it also had a bunch of little houses and such. But that site slopes like fourteen percent, um, and trying to put a parking lot up that hillside when there's a lot of rock on the site. Um, and a rock is usually not, not, you don't want to spend your money just removing rock. Um, that got to be very challenging to how do we, how do we make some flat areas to park on, dispose of stormwater on a rocky site? Um, that, that was pretty challenging. We ended up putting a huge detention tank for stormwater under the lowest parking deck, just next to the park in behind the wall there. And then that water is, um, trickled out via a constricted and um, i can't remember what we used on that one but we have a um like an orifice control that allows only i think the city is, allows a maximum of like 20 gallons per minute um and it just dribbles into the the storm combined storm sanitary system we also worked on the um downtown spokane downtown stadium which just opened recently um, that had a lot of challenges as well um, from there was rock all over the sites and um, we had we were basically um, dictated the grades by trying to match the street on the south side of the site so you kind of can come off the street onto the field. So we have a lot of retaining walls. We had a lot of rock that we had to remove. We had to get rid of storm water on the site. Still, we have some huge gravel galleries under the under there that we were able to get some infiltration slowly. But we have some it's basically detention under the under the field. So um, there's also some projects we've worked on when you have high groundwater, which we don't have a lot of that here. But we're working on some projects in Seattle where, you know, they got to put parking in and they put parking below ground, but you're below the groundwater level and, and you can't just pump that most of the time you don't want to be just pumping the water table um infinitely um so you try to figure out how do we keep the water out of the building or parking um and basically create a i call it reverse bathtub you don't want the water inside it but you want it outside of it and you don't want it coming in so those present some big challenges as well um there's a lot of projects around um, here that are encountering whether it's um, hazardous materials um, along old railroad right away or the river, um, some industrial stuff. Uh, there's a lot of that we're dealing with now and a lot of rocky sites. So those are all, all present a lot of challenges, especially from a cost aspect. Sounds like problem solving in general is a big part of your job. Yep. Okay, next question, Spokane Valley Tech. Good morning, my name is Kenny. I was curious, how do you handle the situation once you've been removed from a job or you're working and they don't want to work anymore because of a safety issue that we're talking about? How do you handle that? Getting removed from a project after work? Yes, sir, that was the question. Um, and that, and like refer, referring to the, the previous example I was using, is that what you're talking to about? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay, thanks. Sorry about that. Um, it's it's super frustrating. I, nobody, I never want to lose a client because we're told we didn't do a good job. Um, I'm coming. One thing I've learned, it, it gets a bit frustrating. Um, we have a ton of experience doing, and, and me being here 25 years, I've got a lot of experience working in this, in this area. Um, one thing about professional services and consulting, usually like um, selection process for publicly funded projects, a lot of times like design build pursuits. Um, we we are all, we're selected on qualifications and not lowest price, which that's a good thing, but that leaves a lot of ambiguities on the flip side of it. So um, when we don't get selected on projects. And the other, and the in favor of other people that don't have the qualifications we do, it's a head scratcher to me. Um, that's an it kind of because obviously I'm liking math and science. I like the black and white. It's right or wrong, and you can show me why. Um, like I said on this other thing, uh, it, it, there's some polit uh, it gets political at times, and that's where it gets frustrating to me. And I tried not to 
dwell on it much. I'd rather choose not to work with somebody on our terms rather than have somebody tell us they don't want us anymore. Um, but it, 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 it leaves a sour taste in your mouth and, um, and, and it does get frustrating. Um, we, we always try to take the high road. And even though the situation has happened, we're still on the other project and we still are doing our best that we can on that project to do everything that we think we're supposed to do. So that's one thing I would recommend is it, you can get upset about things and get frustrated but it's always better to take the high road. You never know when things come back around your way. Okay, I think we have time for probably one more question each um, for the, from the high schools. So uh, why don't we go ahead with lacrosse with your last question? Hi, my name is Ty. Uh, what is your favorite aspect of your job? My favorite aspect of my job is, okay, so my dad was the manager at the parkade downtown for, for well, he worked there all, almost all his life. And I worked for him occasionally in the summer during college. And I'll tell you, sitting in front of a clock that's like a foot from your face and, and knowing no matter what you do, you're there for eight hours a day, you know, doing the same thing. What I like about my job is every job is different. And, and most of the time, since some projects die, most of the time you get to work on something and you get to see it completed and know and have the satisfaction of, hey, I got to work on that. Look, look at that there. And I was a part of that. Um, and so just having every project be different, every project has its nuances that every side is different. That's what I really enjoy. Every, it, it's just the variety and seeing something get completed and moving on to other things. So Ken Valley Tech. What is your work life balance look like? <laughs> Oh, throw, wait, wait till the end for the tough one. What I'll say about it, it, it is a challenge, to be honest with you. I've been a lot better at it. Um, when I was single, I would do a lot of work at home. Um, with email, texting, all of that. But I go back to when I first started and we had faxes and such. We weren't connected 24-7. And so I think a lot of people don't expect you to be, but you know, having, having a phone right at your side all the time and having people communicate all, all hours, you obviously want to be better than your competition or re more responsive than your competition. And sometimes that entails going the extra mile. But I, I think honestly with COVID, there's been a lot of, um, self reflections and, and thinking about about life where a lot of people I've noticed um, do a better job I guess at balancing that um, and you know a lot a lot of our staff I don't know if it's a, the best thing I feel like our culture in our office has been affected some because we'll have days where it's kind of dead in here but a lot of people do take uh, opportunities to work from home. It's not always the best for everybody, and it's definitely not great for young staff that doesn't get to um, be around other staff and learn from them and get the mentoring. But there's there's a there's an understanding now that hey, if we want good people working for us, we're going to make um, sacrifices or we're going to we're going to make allowances for people that are responsible. Um, to go do things that they want to do. I have one employee that's really good and I trust him and he does what he says he's going to do. He actually went to Mexico two years in a row now for a month and worked part time and, and worked and then took vacation part of the time while he was gone. And most clients, I, I was at a, we have a, a holiday open house every year in our office. And he, and he had just gotten back from Mexico. And I remember one of the clients just saying, uh, I didn't even know you were in Mexico when we were on those phone calls and meetings. So there's things that we are doing to to help people be able to to do things like that. To and and, and it and I think that works both directions. You know, he enjoys the opportunity to be able to do things like that, where maybe all jobs won't let him do that. Um, and we appreciate him working for us and are willing to allow that to happen. 
Hey, great. Thank you so much, Wade. Um, I think we're uh, nearing the end of our event here today. Is there anything else you'd like to share about a career in civil engineering that hasn't already been touched in, in the previous questions, Wade? Um, it, I mean, it's definitely, definitely a challenging job. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it takes about two years, I would say, to feel like, hey, the light, I can see it on guys in our office, the young employees, you know, it's about two years in, one and a half to two years where the light bulb goes on and it's like, I've got this. But it's, it's, it takes a while to kind of figure everything out. There's so much to learn. And, and there's a lot of things that, um, you know, the permitting side of things, a lot of times I feel like I'm a negotiator or a lawyer at, at times trying to get, again, solve problems. Um, how do we get reviewers like things to fit the box? Like, hey, we have a prescriptive measures of codes. We want you to meet that. But so many sites are just not don't fit the box, and so we have, that's where our creativity gets gets in. And and going back to one of the questions, that the creativity, a lot of the creativity stems from challenges that are unforeseen in the field, and trying to figure out, okay, now how do we do this? Now that we encountered this, that's where kind of the real engineering ha happens, and that's where it kind of gets a bit fun. Um, it can be it can be super challenging, but. Uh, um, it's very rewarding to see things, though, that you get to be a part of that, you know, are lasting for years and years. Um, it's, it's, it gives you a good satisfaction. Thank you so much, Wade. Um, once again, uh, I really uh, just want to emphasize that it's so wonderful to have somebody here who's spent so much time in the career to be able to talk about the positives, the negatives, the challenges, um, and the, just the real life daily work. And especially when it comes to civil engineering, like you say, you, you weren't real sure what it was when you got into it, um, but uh, there's so many different aspects of it. And um, so I think it's very helpful that you're here today to share that information with students who might be maybe considering a, a career in civil engineering. We'd also like to thank um, our two student groups that are with us today, and I'm just going to add them up here on the screen. Uh, La Crosse High School, thank you so much for joining us in the Spokane Valley Tech, and uh, especially appreciate the instructors making time in their schedules for their students to be part of this event. Again, I just wanna thank everyone for being with us today. Uh, we hope, especially for the students, that you found this session interesting and informative, and that what you learned uh, may help you to decide whether or not a career in civil engineering is right for you.